Sean Hurley's a phenomenal bass player, one of the best out there today. He started out on the East Coast and got his first big break touring with Arlo Guthrie. He initially gained prominence as the bass player in Vertical Horizon. Sean began his LA chapter when Bobby Keys brought him out here to do some writing with Robin Thicke. He has since toured and or recorded with the likes of Alicia Keys, Ringo Starr, Annie Lennox, Miley Cyrus, and Rob Thomas, to name a few. Sean's been playing with John Mayer for the past six years, both in the studio and on the road. He's one of the most in-demand session players here in Los Angeles these days, and recently we had the opportunity to sit down and talk music in the treehouse. Let's begin by, by discussing, you know, sort of how you got started in this kind of, uh, with bands and touring. And so for me it started in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. I born and raised there, which is like two hours from Boston, so the big city is too far away to go on a daily basis and interact with people, so I just met other musicians. I got a bass when I was 11, played saxophone when I was 10, kind of let it go, and a neighborhood kid happened to play drums. I was like, man, you should play bass, because nobody does. I was young and impressionable, I was like, okay. We went out, got me a bass, an old Hagstrom four string, I start taking lessons. Within a couple of years, I become the music teacher, the bass teacher at the local store. So I was giving lessons. And Arlo Guthrie, uh, back in the late 60s, you know, set down his roots in western Massachusetts in a town called Washington. I met his son, who was in a band. And by the time I'm 16, Arlo was wanting to take his son out on the road. And his son was probably 20, 21. So my first touring gig in a bus and traveling was the summer that in between sophomore junior year when I was in uh, playing with Arlo Guthrie. Awesome. Um, and from then on, it was easy to go, yeah, this is the path I should continue down on. And, and yes, it's possible to be a bass player. That's amazing. And so, but so then what was the next step? I, I know you, you eventually, Vertical Horizon was sort yeah, of- Yeah, that thing, it's, right? it's, there's some disjointed moments because I went to Berkeley for a little bit, lived in Boston. It's kind of, it's dreary when you're like, you were a professional musician at a young age and then you're I'm 20, 21, living in Boston, having to go do 40 hours a week at Whole Foods just yeah. to pay the bills. So one, one night I spoke up to a buddy and I just mentioned, I was like, dude, is there like, Let's go see some music. There's got to be something we can tap into where we're playing more instead of going to our jobs. And he's like, oh yeah, let's go to this place called the Brendan B and go to this little place and I see Kevin Barry playing guitar, Paul Bryan playing bass. And through that little blues community, I hear about some band that got signed to RCA. I go for an audition in the guy's house in Worcester, Mass, in mom's basement. I audition, I'm the first guy in. They call me up, hey man, you're in, you're the best we've heard. And I go in and, we, and then it's, it's full on band mode from that point. We're rehearsing, we're pre-production stuff, you know, running the same 12 songs over and over again to then play for the producer. There is an infrastructure that right. is, that's the game you want to be in where you're doing music, people are listening, you got the best and brightest minds trying to create the music with you. You got the best and brightest trying to sell it and market it and get you out on tours. You suddenly, for me, it was like, now there's booking agents, there's A&R people. And it was a great education learning about radio visits and promotion and how a song actually, yeah. it's like the, I'm just a bill song, you know, where a bill becomes so a law. Like, little. how does a band yeah. and a song actually become a hit? I started setting my sights on LA as Vertical Horizon was on the road in 99 and right around when Vertical Horizon's putting out the record one of my blues guys had a connection with Robin Thicke out here in LA so it was the classic bass player tale like hey do you know any good bass players and then he brought me out on one trip and I went up to Robin's house in the hills and he was just playing songs and that was when it finally was like okay I'm doing sessions in LA. Like I'm getting paid money, I'm in Los Angeles, I'm playing bass for a guy who I thought was extremely talented, and I still do. But all that took place over that 10 year period, I'd say, from 
99 to 2009. We're just locking it in little by little, expanding the peer group and the, the client base, I guess it is. Let's talk about how from from this point here, you, you got into touring with John Mayer, like right. you're doing currently. Well, I learned early on, fortunately, it's like I was playing blues and that led to Vertical Horizon. So I was like, oh, right, great, do every gig. And then from the blues community, then it also led to Robin Thicke in LA. And from Robin, his engineer, Bill Molina, led to various producers in LA. And so I was like, great. If I keep saying yes, you never know what happens. And then the, the pathway to Mayer was this, the same kind of thing where I, I met a guitar player, Brad Fernquist, just on the sideman scene. And, uh, Brad had a friend that was playing with Mayer at the time, and his second record had come out. And I went to see a Mayer show and chatted with him, and we had mutual friends, so we hit it off personally. But it, it's, I've never, it, you know, it wasn't to, to, uh, chase a gig. It's just I met John in say 2005 or 4 and because I knew some of his sidemen and you know often musicians get along with other musicians so we met hung out that night and then I met his guitar player David Ryan Harris and he had just done a little record that Mike Elizondo produced and I'm a big fan of Mike's playing and ev pretty much everything he does. He's a producer, songwriter. So when I met David I was like man if you're going to do gigs in LA, I'd love to play them with you. Because at that point, I was looking for fresh people to play with. So I call them up, I go and play with them, and we've been like frickin' frack. And that's, I gotta say, it's like 2004 maybe? And I didn't play, start playing with John until 2008. So this is how these things, just there's this long glacial movement. Now we're jumping to 2006. I get a call on the phone as I answer, and it was John saying, hey man, I got a session tomorrow at Conway with Alicia Keys. She, she said she was gonna bring a bass player. She didn't, can you go? And he had known me from playing, sitting in with David Ryan Harris. and He had heard me play and was like, man, this is fun, you're good. So that really solidified it. That track went on her record. And that's 2006, two years later, you know, he's looking for a bass player. And he called me up and was like, hey, would you come out on the road? And I was like, I gotta do it. And so I started touring with him in 2008, and it's just been, now it's 2014, and I've continued to play with him. I've recorded some records with him. But it all goes back to, it was like, was it Brad Fernquist that I, that hooked me up with the keyboard player, you know, meeting David Ryan Harris to be realized, like, we had got so much in common, so. But it's, you've got to be in the game, I guess, is what I took away from it. Like, you've, you've got to constantly be saying yes. Yes, I would, yes and, is like the, the classic, you know, improv thing. Epiphany moment. An epiphany moment for me was when I'm making that transition where I think I'm good and I'm getting the accolades like, yeah, you're great, and you can play with a click, and you can play, you can put the, the bass note in the right place. But because of my age and my finances, I've got, like I had to buy a five string bass to be in Vertical Horizon. So I get this bass, it's active, maple fingerboard. I think I know what I'm doing tonally. I didn't have it figured out then. I thought I did, and I struggled live, and I'd hear my tone through NS10s and an LA-2A and go, that's the sound I like, and then I go live, and it's like, you're not gonna get that tone with right. all this bright stuff going. And I flew to LA to play for Robin Thicke for the first time. And I play, and they love what I'm playing, but they're like, oh yeah, we'll, we'll probably, you know, do something with the bass after the fact, we'll compress it again in the mix or something. And I just get like, internally like, this can't be happening. Why is it not right? What's wrong? Like, this is me and my bass. We're doing our thing. Yeah. And I realized like, oh, it's not necessarily just what you play. It's the instrument you play it on. But of course I flew out. I got one bass and my buddy hands me a, still it was a five string, but it had 
rosewood board and pass a pickups and I play it, same part, same guy, and, then, and uh, suddenly it sinks into yeah. the track and everybody in the room is like, oh yeah, that's better. That's it, it's yeah. really sinking <laughs> in the track and people start moving. I was like, okay, epiphany, like, yeah. I gotta buy some other bases. I gotta have some other options. I gotta get my passive thing together yeah. right away. Like I just thought, well if I got a vintage jazz bass, and a five string that's active, like one of them will be right. Like, well, no, now you gotta have three options of that, three options of that. And in and, and my gigs, one gig. So if you wanna play gospel stuff or if you wanna play in, you know, Rihanna's band or whatever, like check out what guys in, in the gig or a similar gig are using yeah. and at least have that. Two of my favorite tools. For me, it's like the bass and the amp are my are my tools. So it's evolved through the years, and I I also didn't kind of wake up to the easiest way to get the sound you love is to actually just get the gear that you like when you hear it on a record. So for me, the B15, a 60s B15, and my P bass. It can be either my 61 with flats or my 66 with browns. But those two, yeah, those like 90% of the time, again, it's about sitting in the track and making the people that are looking to fill that low end void with my bass. It's when they start to go, yeah, you know, it, it's happening. It's, it's got to sink in. Dream back. So I'm gonna delimit myself to like the classic Beatles setup. It's four four guys. So I gotta go with me on bass because yeah, it's a good call. I, I would like to experience this. <laughs> so I'll do John Bonham on the drums. Nice. I'll put Hendrix on guitar because oh, I think wow. that would be awesome. But then vocalist, is, I, I'm probably gonna get uh, skewered for this. But I want I want. Bon Scott and the band. I want to, I want to know what it <laughs> yeah, feels man. like to play with Bon. That, that would be a funny one. I like that. that. It might be, hor we might have horrible songs, yeah. but man, the jams I think would be really cool. I love this. I right. know Bon Scott is a bit of a, a that that could be the wild card that, that puts you over the edge. Yeah, that could be your that could be the one. He was my that that was the stuff that spoke to me when I was 12 years old. Like. That's probably what, that was the first music, ACDC was the first music that I loved. It was like, this is my music. Yeah, that's all it takes. All right, good stuff. Sweet. <laughs>